ado, we have Matt Curry, a successful entrepreneur, Fairfax County graduate, coming here to talk to us today about some of his experiences and some uh, life lessons he can share with you. So, Matt Curry. Like I said, my name is Matt Curry. I'm a craft and auto care. Um, I'm here to talk to you about three things today. Uh, actually, I don't have a click here. So, the topics I want to talk to you today, really the message I want to get out to you is what makes you bizarre also makes you beautiful. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and how I think uh, entrepreneurship can maybe help you guys attain some of your goals and dreams. Um, all right. Uh, so about a little about me, I'm a husband and father, I'm a native Washingtonian, I was born in Sibley Hospital in D.C., I uh, grew up in Vienna, so I'm a native Washingtonian, a proud, proud native Washingtonian. Uh, I'm an automotive expert, an entrepreneur, I've started over 20 different companies, my space is most automotive, uh, I'm a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, uh, which is pretty cool, I race cars, I'm an adventure seeker, and a uh, thrill seeker, so, and I have massive ADD or attention deficit disorder. Um, as uh, Mike said, I said, my name is Matt. Some people call me Hazmat, short for hazardous material. Uh, my wife says that she's the Tasmanian devil whisperer uh, because uh, sometimes you know, I'm pretty, you know, kind of off the hook out there. Um, tell me if any of this sounds like you, if like three things or more of these sound like you. You, lack, you often lack attention to detail. You talk too much. You're impulsive or compulsive. You raise your hands. You're easily distracted. You're short-tempered sometimes. You say inappropriate things at inappropriate times. <laughs> well, all you guys are hands up, you might have ADD. That's what's wrong. That's what's wrong. I knew there was something, right? Well, a little bit about my relationship with ADD. I was actually medically diagnosed with ADD when I was uh, about 11 years old. Um, in school, when I was younger, I was uh, very rambunctious. I would get in trouble, talk too much, couldn't sit still in class. Uh, I often had outbursts. And I guess at some point, uh, my, te my teachers and parents decided there was something wrong with me. Right? So, uh, in between the summer of 7th and 8th grade, they took me to Boston. My parents took me to Boston, the Children's um, uh, Medical Center. I went through two days of rigorous testing and evaluation, putting square pegs and round holes, ink water tests. And on the third day, the morning of the third day, they brought me in. Uh, so I'm in a hospital in an office. There's two doctors there with white lab coats. I don't know if you have my parents there. Yeah, I was, like I said, about 11 years old. I was a bit intimidated, you know? And basically, they told me that I had pretty severe AD, ADD or ADHD and uh, slight dyslexia. And I was going to have to work three or maybe even four times harder than anybody else to have any type of success in school or in life <laughs> or in my work. So how do you feel? You're 11 years old and you're sitting in an office with these two experts and your parents, and they said basically, you know, you're going to have to, you're not going to be successful if you, if you don't work harder than everybody else. So what they decided was that I should go on this medication called Ritalin. And back in 1978, Ritalin was a new thing. They didn't know much, long, didn't know much about it. But they decided to put me on for my seventh year of, of school, seventh grade. So every day at school, I'd be going, walking down the hall, going to lunch with my, with my buddies. And I have to excuse myself um, and go see, my, go see the nurse, the school nurse, to take my little magic pill. All right? It was a little weird, a little embarrassing. I'm walking down the hall with my friends and they're going to do the nurse subs every day. Like, What's up with that man? And, uh, but it worked. Pretty soon, my teachers noticed, my parents noticed, even I noticed. I was consistent to the whole class. Uh, I almost got straight A's my seventh grade year. But, um, I never actually got straight A's, like five A's and a B like every time. But um, it worked. But it wasn't meant to be. So they didn't know because the Ritalin was a, was a new drug. They didn't know the long-term consequences. So they didn't even know the proper dosage, uh, quite frankly. So they took me off, off of my seventh grade and my, my grades went back to low B's and C's and I went back to my old ways. But I'm really glad that doctors and parents took me off medication. Because I believe what makes you bizarre makes you beautiful. All right? We've always, 
been told that things that people are perceived as our weaknesses or perceived as our weaknesses we need to work on. Those perceived weaknesses may actually be our strengths. It wasn't my case. I, I've always been a little weird, a little out there, high energy. Uh, I've always been short, you know, so um, and that, that always stood out. What have you been told about yourself? What do other people tell you about you? If you're too short, too tall, too fat, too skinny, too pretty, <laughs> too smart, too dumb. So what have people told you about you? We've been told to find and fix our weaknesses when actually some of those weaknesses may be your superpowers. So I tell you to embrace some of those weaknesses, some of those um, uh, things that are eccentric about you. Maybe you're a little weird. Maybe you're a lot creative. All right? Maybe you're super smart. All right? In a geeky way. And maybe you're going to be a brain surgeon. So every, all of these things that some people perceive as our weaknesses could actually be our superpowers. And it wasn't my case. We're always told, you know, to focus on the negatives and not the positives. If you look up here, and my fly is down. Okay, I've got this really cool jacket on. I'm looking pretty good, right? But all you see is that my fly is down. Right? It's not my chest. Right? <laughs> um, then you're going to focus on that. Look, back row is screwed together, but it flies down. All right? So um, my challenge for you today is think about the things that the other people say are your weaknesses and find out if they're actually your superpower. That's my challenge to you. My ADD is my superpower. It allows me to see the big picture. I have super high energy. I can work at a lieutenant, a lieutenant fringe, 18 hour days. I, I'm okay to, and I'm not risk adverse. I can see other things that others can't with my ADD. In racing cars, we teach people, um, I instruct people how to race cars, and uh, we teach people to look ahead. So it allows you to look kind of at the big picture of things. But I can't focus on one thing too long. It's not something I'm interested in. So it often has me building things up and then delegating or turning them over. And that's what a good entrepreneur does. So you learn, you build something up, and then you delegate it out to somebody who's better at it, who has other superpowers that complement your superpowers. So there's a whole list of successful, famous people, celebrities, and entrepreneurs that have ADD. Uh, Michael Phelps, Olympic great. Uh, Michael Phelps and uh, Simone Biles, they both have ADD. Well, ADD, um, Phelps' mom found sports for him, and ADD wasn't a problem in the pool. ADD looked like determination and dedication and discipline in a pool. Simone Biles, it's a routine, right? Gymnast is a routine, and ADD people are really good at routines. So let me give you superpower. What makes you, what makes you bizarre makes you beautiful? Don't fix your weaknesses. Play to your strengths. Don't fix those weaknesses. Find other people that are good at things that you're not good at. And think about some of these things that people tell you are your weaknesses and then that they actually be your strengths. You need to put people in environments where they're going to be successful. I would never be a su successful basketball player. All right? Um, you know, I wouldn't sit there and practice basketball five or six hours a day. It would never happen, right? Um, some symptoms of ADD are distractible, impulsive, restless, hyperactive, uh, can't stay on point. It also makes us curious and creative, energetic, spontaneous, and not risk averse. So every negative has a positive. Every positive has a negative. So why entrepreneurship? Well, all the things that I used to get in trouble for, I now get paid for. Okay, I used to get in trouble for being disruptive and talking too much uh, and not following the rules. And now I talk for a living. I get paid for it. I sell it when I do. Uh, I run around like a maniac and I make my own rules. That's what you do as an entrepreneur. Um, I grew up in the '80s, so I was a high school graduate in '85, so the late '70s, early '80s. And back then, it was all about consumerism and materialism. It was all about being unique. And all the cool people I knew were entrepreneurs. They all had new cars, big houses, and all that. And I was like, I want to be like that. And everybody was watching these new TV shows called MTV. Anybody heard about MTV? <laughs> okay. 
to you. Okay. We share the lifestyles of rock stars and how the cars they drove and all that stuff. Uh, so I wanted that. I always wanted to be my own boss. So I started in the automotive industry. I found something that I really liked. I loved cars. You know, my buddies are crazy about cars. I started at the bottom and worked my way up. I cleaned bathrooms, mop floors, did what I had to do to become an expert in my industry. Worked my way up through an apprentice technician and then a manager. And we learned everything I could about the automotive industry. I ran seven different stores for three different companies, with triple sales everywhere I went. When I was 19, I was running the number two leader store in the country. I said, if I can do this for somebody else, I can do this for myself, right? So I went out and I started my, my first auto repair shop in Chantilly, Virginia, back in the back of a terrible, terrible industrial park with only four parking spots. That's not, that's not very good when you're, you know, your, your product is cars. But we did it, and we started at $103,000 with 13 credit cards. It wasn't the best business plan in the world. Uh, the last credit card we got was from uh, USA for 500 bucks. I told my wife, Judy, so we have to use this, we're screwed. Um, <laughs> so I quit my job, I opened up a shop, we did $800,000 for first nine months of business, 1.6 million our first full year. But the problem we had was we were growing and growing and only had four parking spots. So I had to get creative. Right behind us, right next to us, was a 10 foot walk between a tree line. It was a huge empty parking lot. It was about a mile of drive by car. But you could literally walk through the tree line and be right there. So I just started parking cars. And um, I decided I was going to beg for forgiveness and ask permission. And um, I started parking cars. And that went on for about six months. We had about 20 cars back there. And finally, the owner got on. And he said, we got to move all these cars. I didn't know what I was going to do because I didn't have any place else to put them. So I made a deal with them that I paid 500 bucks a month for 15 or 20 spots, whatever it was. And he said, fine, you have 30 cash the first third month. I said, no problem. The first day I went over there to pay him, I had $500 cash, I went to his office. He didn't tell me he had two big ass dogs, a Doberman and a Rottweiler, right, in his office. I get back to his office, I give him the 500 bucks. These two dogs come around his desk and chase me. I'm running out of his office. I did that every month <laughs> for like four years. All right, and I never got bit by one of the dogs. So, there's uh, things sometimes you need, you're, the park is wor worse than the bite, and you got to do what you got to do, and sometimes you got to ask forgiveness and um, uh, beg permission. Um, so, if you're going to start your own business, I recommend you know, be beginning, begin from the beginning. All right? You need to learn everything about your business to start your business. Um, what separates the entrepreneurs from the entrepreneurs is execution. All right? You've got to execute. In order to execute, you need to have a goal. Our goal was to be the number one auto repair shop in North America with Curry's Auto Service. We had 10 stores. We were voted number one in North America by Motor Age Magazine. Number one in North Virginia by, by readers from North Virginia Magazine. Our niche was automotive repair. Usually high end. I race cars. We did a lot of European stuff, being done for Mercedes. We do it all. I uh, work on everything. But you got to find your niche and you got to know your vision. All right, so what's your vision? Our vision was to have an honest, awesome auto repair shop. We go to the number one auto repair shop in North America, and we had to have a game plan, which is basically your policies and procedures on how you're going to how you're going to get to your vision, the steps you're going to take, the things you're going to do to get there. Um. So, Mike wanted me to talk to you a little about about some of the lessons learned, or overcoming challenges, and all that. Um. I don't consider myself a salesperson, I consider myself a problem solver. People call us because they have problems and they need those problems solved. That's pretty much the case in every deal. That's what entrepreneurs do is they're solving a the market problem. Um, and when you're doing things, when you're looking at businesses or whatever, and you're running a business, you certainly need to look ahead. It's like racing, you're not trying to look around every turn. When you do have a problem, I tell my guys there's a three, three solution rule. First of all, you gotta know what the real problem is versus the perceived problem. Like maybe the problem was for us, we couldn't get a car done. A woman needs to pick up the cars, she can pick up her kids at daycare. Uh, but the real problem is the car's not gonna be done. It's not the real problem is she needs her kids from daycare. Right? So that's the real problem. So we can maybe give her a ride to daycare, lend her a car, rent a car for her, or something like that. So you make you solve problems, come up with three solutions and find out what works best for the customer, get them involved in the, in the decision making. And the way you come up with those, those is a three solution rule is, is it good for the customer, is it good for the company, and is it good for me? Do I feel good about it? 
So you have to empower your customers to help you make those decisions. And solving problems is what everything's all about. It gets down to brass tacks in the real world. You're solving your, your, your job in almost any situation if you're a doctor or an repair guy or whatever, a lawyer, is to solve the problem at hand. And another, another thing to do is, you know, we rely on business coaches, teachers, um, friends. I would say if I'm a friend, we're in a network of entrepreneurs where we have a problem to solve. Yes, oftentimes I'll reach out, hey, I've got this issue, can you help me with it? I've had business coaches, and that's a good idea to have as well. So, Mike wanted me to talk about some of the lessons learned, and I lost it all once. My first automotive repair shop was, it was actually a huge success with a friend of mine, my best friend at the time, a business partner, and we went from uh, $30,000 a month, we bought it, about $100,000 a month within eight, eight or nine months. He was a silent partner who was supposed to help out at the shop. Long, long story short, is we get, we're having some conflict and I offered to buy him out of double what he invested. But I mean, we took a two day, went to the beach for two days, my first day off in like nine months, and uh, got a fax there that uh, they were kicking me out of the business. Him and our accountant were kicking me out of the business, and they changed the locks, changed the bank accounts, and shut me out of the business. So I had my blood, sweat, and tears in that business for a year, basically. Uh, doing, I was the only guy running it. <coughs> and then I had to you know, get into this lawsuit, which I didn't have any money in. I didn't have any money because all my money was invested in the business. business. Then I had to bring the business to the ground. I had to start all over. But you got, you know what? You're young enough that you can start all over many times. Okay, that's the cool thing about it. I'm 53 years old. I don't have that opportunity right now like you guys have. You're going to have bumps in the road, you're going to hit potholes and learn the challenges. Um, but you got to get up and face it, right? So we did in a big way. I started the next, next business eight, um, 18 months after. Like I said, on 13 credit cards, grew to 10 stores, about $20 million a year in revenue. Retired at 47. Wasn't very good at retirement, so here I am back. Um, so you get up and you move on. And you deal with problems. You go back to mine for conflict. You really need to mine for conflict. Find those problems and face them head on. Um, you also need to be prepared to be successful. That means having the proper tools in your toolbox. Um, you know, having being, being prepared, prepared for class, having the right book or the right, the right assignment or whatever. On the game plan, you want to define and write down the processes and procedures that work and practice the art of creative destruction where you break something down something that's already good and make it even better. And always work on efficiencies. I'm a big believer in being blunt. You always know where you stand with me. I don't shoot the good stuff. Um, if, I, if you had a problem, I'll tell you about a problem. If you need to fix it, move on. That's how I feel the best way to do things. Um, oftentimes in racing, you have you get into it with another driver and the driver comes in all pissed off and you're all pissed off and you know, you can talk to the, the race chair and say, well, then you talk to the other driver first. All right, that's the first step, right? So, be blunt, be straight up. It's okay to, to be truthful, right? Always be interviewed. If you're interviewing for a job or interviewing for a class or whatever it may be, I'm always interviewing and trying to look for good people. Learn to delegate. You can't do everything yourself. You're going to have a certain... Uh, set of uh, things that you're good at, strengths, superpowers, and you got things that, that aren't. Well, don't work on the things that you aren't good at, find somebody who is. Right? And listen to your mother. Right? <laughs> Say your please and thank you, hold, hold the doors open for people, give people opportunity that, that you want. So, we started 20 plus businesses, most of them have been successful, most of them not all. Um, we had 10 stores, I, you know, we know about the book and all that stuff. Right now we really have four stores, and we're looking to open a few more here eventually. So if, uh, we are looking for some good people, uh, cashiers and stuff, everyone wants a part-time job. Um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is cool because it allows you to do a lot of different things. Not only is it hopefully profitable, but it allows you to give back to your community. Uh, we've done a lot of missions with Richard Branson, um, some other things that we've done, contributed to a lot of schools and other things. Uh, and it does for freedom. There's no such thing as just two weeks vacation. Like, I can go away for six weeks if I want. Um, so freedom is a big deal with entrepreneurship and success. Um, and eventually, you get to have some really cool experiences. I've driven a 
a Russian MiG fighter, uh, uh, MiG fighter jet at uh, 77,000 feet on the curvature of the Earth. I've been shark diving in, in uh, Africa, um, you know, cage diving, I like Machu Picchu. I've done all sorts of cool stuff. A lot of that's because entrepreneurships help do that, they help build relationships where you can go adventure travel with other people, which is super cool. And now I've created a whole new set of goals. I want to become the first entrepreneur, automotive entrepreneur that I know of that has two different businesses that were ranked number one auto repair shop in North America. That would be awesome. And I want to become, I want to raise cars professionally, uh, the day, um, 24 hour Daytona. So that's probably a few years down the road, but that's one of my goals. Um, so you've got to have those goals to be able to achieve any goals. Um, these are some of my race photos and all that. We're going to video, we're not going to get into that. Uh, we do endurance racing, which is kind of cool. Um, that's with two different, actually three different resources, those are two of them. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the talk today. My name is Matt, and uh, if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to entertain.